eight years old, my dad got a call to be a pastor in Palau. It was going to be just a whole new experience for all of us. I said, it is impossible. No, it's not possible. I just stood there, tears coming down, and I said, God, forgive us. Something then amazing happened that was not part of the program, that was completely unexpected. Everybody just looked about at each other, shocked. It was one of the most incredible periods of Palauan history. I always wanted to go back to Palau. We don't know what memories this is going to bring back, what emotions this is going to stir up. It was a very impactful moment in my life that I don't think I'll ever forget. Well, I want to say, first of all, uh, this evening, Unil Kabasange. <laughs> Ali, 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 Ali. I tell you what, this Palawan language is a difficult language. The way you spell words, my. Watashi wa ne nihonjin da yo. Dakara nihon go shabemas ne. Tokyo de umaratan da yo. Juyo nen gurai nihon de sumimashita. Those of you that don't rec recognize Japanese, you still don't, but uh, that's, what, that's what I was speaking there. I grew up in Japan, 14 years there, in the land of the rising sun. And I understand, I was talking with President Tommy before the service began, the Japanese do make their way, President Sarango, to, to uh, the Republic of Palau. They're good people, yeah. I have the privilege of pastoring on a university campus. And I have scientist friends. And the, and, and the great thing about scientists, they're always looking for the theory of everything. They want to find one theory that explains the whole universe. Just everything reduces to this one single theory. Um, God bless them. I hope they find it one day. They haven't yet. But you know, when I, think about, when I think about the universe, I believe, there is, I believe there is a line that summarizes every truth in the universe into a single sentence. I'm going to put that line on the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. That line on the screen for you right now. You know, my PowerPoint is working here. There's the, so here's where we're going. I want to tell you about that book in a second, The Sunflower and the Reasons We Won't Forgive. But let me, do, let me just put the line... Uh, on the screen, and I'm pointing, Richard, in your direction, or should I be pointing another way? There we go. Can you see that line? The maker of all things loves and wants me. I believe that single line tells the truth of the universe, that all the universe's evidence and realities can be reduced to that one line, the maker of all things loves and wants me. I hope by the time we're through, uh, the time you and I are together are through, that line will stay in your heart, stay in your mind. I want to talk, I mentioned this a moment ago, I want to talk about The Sunflower, because The Sunflower is a book, I have the book in my hand, written by Simon Wiesenthal, subtitle of the book, On the Possibilities and Limits of Forgiveness. Now, Simon Wiesenthal was a Jew a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust. He lost 86 of his family. 
brutally murdered, killed. He survived. Years later, he tells a story that he had never told before. It was when he was on a, on a, on a work detail in a Polish concentration camp. So he's a Polish Jew. He's working as just a young man in his teens. When he feels one, one afternoon a tap on his shoulder, it's a nurse from a nearby hospital. The nurse is saying, and when you're, when you're a prisoner in a concentration camp, you don't ask questions, you just come. He follows her. She leads him to a little hospital near the work site, through that uh, front door, down several dingy hallways, up a stairway, another hallway. She opens a door and she motions him. He goes inside the room. When his eyes finally adjust to the darkness, there's a slit in the, uh, in the shades that have been pulled down. When his eyes adjust, he realizes there's a bed in the middle of the room. Draped in, draped in a sheet on top of the bed is a form. It's obviously a human being. But it is a bizarre human being. The head of the individual is wrapped totally, totally in gauze. It's just wrapped with band-aids around and around the head. There, there, are, there, are, there, there is a hole for the nose. There is a hole for the mouth. Two holes for the ears. And where the eyes should have been, just yellow pus. Turns out that the form under that sheet has asked, find a Jew for me. The Polish nurse found young Simon. You know why? Because that man, that young man, an errant Christian. Look at Palau is 87% Christian, according to Wikipedia. So there are a lot of Christians in this space right now. A, a Christian not acting out his faith. Under orders, had been commanded to join some of his SS colleagues in herding 150 Jewish men, women, and children into a single uh, dwelling place. They gassed the dwelling place, threw in hand grenades, so that it set the place ablaze, and then stood outside with their guns, gunning down anybody that would dare run out of the flames. 150 people just brutally murdered. That man is on his deathbed. He is, he is struggling with a guilty conscience. And there's not a soul in this room that doesn't know the meaning and the feeling of a guilty conscience. Come on, be honest. We all do. He's wrestling. He's facing death. He has to confess. He has to repent to somebody. And so this young Jew is there. And his hand reaches out. Gray hands, bloodless hands. And he tries to prop himself up. And he says, I can't talk very loud. But he stands, spends hours with young Simon relating the, in detail what has taken place. And his last words are, will you forgive me? Simon Wiesenthal describes that question in his mind. And he writes, a battle was raging within. What a contrast between the glorious sunshine outside and the shadow of this bestial age here in the death chamber. I stood up and looked in his at. at in his direction, at his folded hands, at last I made up my mind and without a word left the room. No forgiveness. Still tormented by that realization. He sent, this, he sent the, the manuscript of the story that I just briefly relayed to you to, 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 to 39 thought leaders, movie stars, scientists, moral leaders, and he said, if you had been me, what would you have done? And the book is a collection of their answers. It's a fascinating read. Here's my question for you tonight. Would you have forgiven that Nazi SS soldier repenting for 150 deaths that he helped commit murders? Would you forgive? Listen, let's dial this, let's dial this, let's dial this real tight to us right here in Palau tonight. Ruth de Paiva. Those two, with the presidents we just talked about, those two public forgiveness, forgivenesses, if I can use that word. Would you, like Ruth, have forgiven Justin? He's just two blocks away, by the way, serving three life sentences. Would you have forgiven Justin? Now we put it to where the rubber meets the road in Palau. 
I'm going to go back 2,000 years to another young Jew. We have this young Jew sitting on the edge of a stained hospital bed. We push the hospital bed up close to the bloody cross 2,000 years ago. Both young Jews, both confronted with the issue, shall I forgive? I want to take you to familiar words in the, the Gospel of Luke. We're thinking about uh, Calvary. I'm reading now. You see it on the screen. Two other men, both criminals. That was Good Friday. It was an awful Friday, but we call it Good Friday now. Two other men, both criminals, were also, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. And Richard, are we going to have to just, will you just then follow what I'm reading and uh, just leave it on the screen until I move to the next one? This thing is not working. And when the, when the three came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, now this is, the, this is the young Jew who has already been scourged by the Roman executioner. He takes a little flagrum, it's a wooden stick, it has leather straps affixed to the top. Embedded in the leather are pieces of bone, metal, and rock. And the executioner, the big burly executioner, what he does, he strips you naked, your hands are tied over your head, you're facing away from him. He pulls back the flog room and he, he flicks his wrist so that the straps go around the torso of the victim to be executed and then he yanks it back and he literally shreds the back and the chest. So Jesus has been scourged. He's nailed now. He's nailed to the cross through the wrist and the ankle. Jesus said, in that posture, can you believe this? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Come on. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Time out, Jesus. Can we just do a little time out with you, Lord? That's a beautiful prayer, but it doesn't make a bit of sense. You can't tell me they don't know what they're doing. You don't think the executioner knew? Has he yanked it back? You don't think the hammer and the mallet in the hands of another soldier, that this was all, we well, didn't know what we were doing. And yet that young Jew who declared himself to be the creator of the universe, the maker of all things, who loves and wants us, he breathes a prayer before he dies. And it's that prayer right there on the screen in front of you. Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't know what they're doing. Would you have forgiven that Nazi soldier? Would you forgive Justin like Ruth DePiva did, like young Melissa did? Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. May I remind you that the one who prayed that prayer is the one who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Come on, let's put that on the screen. We'll put it on the screen. There we go. Our, let's read it. Listen, 87% Christian, you've prayed this. You, most of this room has prayed this prayer before. Let's read it out loud together. We'll pray it out loud until we'll get to a line that will make us, it'll force us to stop. Let's read it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, he was anticipating what's going on as well. But let's just stop it right there. We just, we just read that line. Maybe we didn't mean it, but we just read it. And in the prayer are these words, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, I'm going to show you a line. I'm going to put another line on the screen, how the, how the Greek actually reads there. This is fascinating. The old King James taught us to pray that first line. Now we're going to read the second line. And forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. Isn't that amazing? That's past tense. That's punctiliar and past tense. And forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. What's going on there? Jesus is meaning exactly what he's, what he's taught us to pray. 
In fact, there's only one commentary that he makes on the Lord's Prayer. It's in the tucked away Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. The only comment he makes, it's not about our Father, it's not hallowed be your name. No, no comment on any of that except, let's go to the next slide. Except, notice this, just two verses later, for after he's through the Lord's Prayer, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will do what? He'll also forgive you. But read the, don't, don't skip the next verse, keep going. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now that, that, that is a point, and if this, if, it, if this were the only time when Jesus makes that comment, we'd say, well, that's just kind of a, maybe a, a, a toss away. We don't have to really take it seriously. But a few chapters later, Peter comes sallying up to Jesus one day, and Peter's feeling, you, you remember Peter? Peter was a plowing. He was a fisherman to the core. And I mean a great fisherman, one of the world's greatest. And I understand you have the world's greatest here in the Republic of Palau. So Peter's feeling pretty magnanimous today. He says, Lord, I got a question for you. Let's put it on the screen. This is in uh, Matthew 18. Peter came to Jesus. No, no, please go back. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, I got a question for you. How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Whoa, how about up to seven times? Because the rabbis in the time of Peter, they said the maximum, based on an incorrect interpretation from the book of Amos, they said the, the maximum forgiveness you give is three. So Peter says, I'm doubling it, and I will add, oh, bless you. Thank you, Glenn. I'm going to double it and add one more just to be safe. How about I forgive my brother seven times? <laughs> and Jesus, you remember the story. Jesus answered, hey, Peter, you said seven? I'm going to tell you something, boy. Not seven times, but 77 times. Some translations say seven times 70. It doesn't matter. Jesus is making a big point here. Let's go to the next slide. Because uh, Lewis Smead's the great ethicist, and I had a privilege of interviewing him on camera, a program that I used to host called The Evidence. And he's just a brilliant mind. This is from his book on forgiveness. I've got the title jotted down, and you'll see it at the end here. The Art of Forgiving When You Need to Forgive and Don't Know How. (laughs) That's a great title. So this is Lewis Smith's. The question is never how many times we're supposed to forgive, but how many times we need to forgive. Keep reading. Forgiving is a gift, not a duty. Oh, I have to forgive. No, it's a gift. It is meant to heal, not to obligate. Some people say, well, I'm going to forgive you. Have you ever walked up to somebody and said, guess what? I forgive you. And the person's never asked for forgiveness. You're trying to get a repentance from that person. We use forgiveness to manipulate. Oh, now you're sorry. It doesn't work that way. Forgiveness is a gift, not a duty. It's meant to heal, not to obligate. So the only good answer to Peter's question is, here it is, use the gift of forgiveness as often as it takes to set you free from a miserable past you cannot shake. Some of you are stuck with a past now that you have not been able to shake. You can't shake it. The only way that that past is going to get taken out of your life is if you forgive somebody. You've been hurt. You've been shamed. You heard that word several times this evening. You've been shamed. You've been ridiculed. You've been wounded. You've been abused. You've been used. You've been hurt to the core. The only way you can be set free from that past, free from a miserable past you cannot shake, is the gift of forgiveness. Ruth Depaiva got that. She could have gone through her whole life seeking revenge, but she didn't. Hours after she lands on this island, she said, let me see the man. Wow. But that's Jesus' point. You know, twice now, Matthew's making the point, if you don't forgive, you're not going to get forgiven. And our first reaction is, oh, man, grumpy God. He is so hard to please. I'm telling you, God, why are you like that? That's what we think. No, it has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you. Because guess what? Listen, if you can't forgive somebody, that means you're holding on to an unforgiving spirit, true or false. Of course, it's true. You're holding on to an unforgiving spirit. So if you're holding on to an unforgiving spirit, guess what? God can't forgive you. You're holding on to an unforgiving spirit. You have to let go. Then God says, now we can do business. It's not grumpy God. It's wise Brilliant God who says, the ball's in your court. You have to play it now. Don't come to me and say, forgive me. No, Jesus, the actual wording says, forgive us our sins as we forgave. 
I'm a forgiver. Please forgive me. It's okay. I'll forgive you. Of course, you let go. That was beautiful tonight. These two men visiting with, with us together. That's what forgiveness does. It just says, I let go. Wow. So it's not about God being some kind of an ogre and can't get over it. No, there's a, uh, let, me, let me go to the next slide because the, here's the, what, I, what I call the, the uh, Jesus makes the point. This is how my heavenly father would treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. That's twice now he's made the point. Notice the next slide. Also from the book of Matthew. That's Matthew 10 actually. But I call it the forgiveness golden rule. Let's read it out loud together. Freely you have received. Freely what? If you've received freely, you freely, have you received forgiveness freely? People who are forgiven know how to forgive. You have to know you're forgiven. When you know you're forgiven, and in the few minutes we have left, you're going to know you are forgiven. Once you know that, you can forgive like Ruth and Melissa. Ah, wow. Wow. I want to go back to that uh, prayer on the cross. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, advancing it to the next slide, please. So when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. By the way, why is he nailed in between them? Because Jesus identified himself with the likes of you and me, with rebels, we're sinners. We, 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 we mess up. We're, we're, we're bad sometimes in the way we behave. He said, put me in the middle of them. He's one with us. He's bearing my sins and your sins. When they came to the place called the skull, he, he was crucified in the middle with one criminal on the right and one criminal on the left. Justin is a forgiven criminal, but he's a criminal. Jesus was nailed with two criminals. And then Jesus prays in between the two criminals, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That is a profound prayer, and I want to show you how profound it is. My favorite book that I have in my library, and I've, I've read it multiple times. I get so blessed every time I read it. It's a little book. It's a classic on the life of Christ called Desire of Ages. I'm going to put a line on, uh, from Desire of Ages on the screen for you here. That prayer of Christ, there from the center cross, that prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced the what? The world. Not the village, not the town, not the country. It embraced the world. Now keep reading because this gets even more provocative. It took that prayer. That prayer took in every sinner that had lived or should live from the beginning of the world to the end of time. How many sinners does that cover? That's pretty much everybody. Are we in that coverage? We are in that coverage. That prayer was for you and that prayer was for me. That prayer took in every sinner. Next line, please. Upon all of us rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. To all, forgiveness is freely offered. Keep reading. Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. Now, this is really important for you to get because it's called the gospel, the everlasting gospel. When Jesus breathed that prayer 2,000 years ago, the entire human race was forgiven. You're not forgiven when you do something. You're not forgiven if you go through some, some penance. You're not forgiven if you, if you can recite the Lord's Prayer 20 times in a row. You're not forgiven for that reason. You're forgiven because somebody forgave you. 2,000 years before you were even born, you got forgiven, and so did I. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's true about the way you treat me, and that's true about the way I treat you. That's true about all of us. We don't know what we're doing. If we really knew what we were doing, we would not do what we are doing. They don't know what they're doing. Boy, that's true. Wow. That is a radical prayer. I want to read it one more time. Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. Until I know I am freely forgiven, I will never extend my forgiveness freely to anybody. 
if you haven't received, you can't give. How can you give what you haven't received? The only way we can effectively forgive, lastingly, or you can say the words, you can get past the, that, that initial, okay, I forgive you. But until we experience the depth of divine forgiveness, our human forgiveness will be limited. We just can't help it. There's no supernatural in me or in you by ourselves. What was supernatural about what Ruth did? What was supernatural about what young Melissa did is both women knew they were forgiven. And out of that sense of for, I have been forgiven, they were then freed. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not an admission of some sort of defectiveness on your part. It's not anything but you saying, what you did to me was wrong, but I forgive you. That's what she said. You heard the presidents. They heard it themselves. I forgive you. My. It's called the gospel. The maker of all things loves and wants me. And because of that, we've been forgiven. And we can freely, freely we have received. It's a golden rule. Freely you receive, freely give. Is there somebody in your life tonight that needs forgiveness? Then I'll end with a story. Is there somebody in your life tonight that needs forgiveness? Maybe the moment I asked that question, boo, a picture, a, a face popped into your mind. Is there somebody on this planet that needs to hear from you? I forgive you. Well, if you're saying, well, as soon as he repents after what he did to me, as soon as she repents after what she did to me, okay, then I'll think about it, but not until then. Wrong. What did Jesus do on the cross? Did anybody repent while they were nailing him? Not a soul, not one. His closest followers have, have fled him. You can't hinge your forgiveness on somebody else's repentance. Or then it's just quid pro quo, this for that. Now that's a deal. That's not forgiveness. There's no strings attached. Now we'll talk tomorrow night. Don't miss tomorrow night because we're going to take, take, take a very drill down into this concept of forgiveness. There are two profound stories of forgiveness. We're doing one of them and we're going to do another one and we're going to come back to the first one and then we're going to end with the second one. Those two stories will occupy our time together. Don't miss tomorrow night. Father, forgive them. They're not asking for it. They don't know what they're doing. But forgive them, please. We were forgiven 2,000 years ago. Freely you've received. Come on, if there's somebody you know, begin thinking strategically. How do I get to him? How do I get to her? What shall I, how shall I do it? You know what? The, the, the Jesus who gave you the example, his spirit will give you the strategy. You'll know what to do. You'll know what to do. You follow what you're showing. And you'll find a peace that passes understanding. So the Bible calls it peace that passes understanding. You'll be set free. No sense in suffering a day longer. I want to end with a story. I love the story. The, this is a, of a prison warden, okay? So we've got a prison, um, a jail a couple blocks away, but this is about a prison warden, and we have a lot of prisons in the United States, as you probably know. So this is a story, Kenyon J. Scudder, uh, one of the great prison wardens of the West, like to tell about the time a friend of his was on a train, okay? So the prison warden has a friend who's riding a train. This is back when train travel was the way to travel in the U.S. of A., okay? So he likes to tell the story about a young man who happened to be sitting next to him. So there's a young man sitting beside him. He's watching this young man. He says, there's something going on with this young man. Watch, keep reading. What happened was unforgettable. The young fella confessed that he was a convict just released from a distant penitentiary. That's all we're talking about tonight as convicts, isn't it? Well, here's another story. Just released from a distant penitentiary his whole life, and I'm thinking Justin, his whole life had cast such a dark shadow over his family, and they had s seemed to suffer such shame. There's that word again. We heard it a lot last night on the screen. We heard it today, tonight. His life had cast such a dark shadow 
that his family seemed to suffer such shame from the, his criminal record that he had lost almost all contact with them. Is it because they're too poor that they can't write back to me? Is it because they're, maybe they're ill? Is it because they've moved away and I don't have their address? But they're not writing back. And then the day comes. He knows he's going to be released from prison. Keep, keep listening. So before his prison sentence was up, he devised this plan to find out how they felt. One that would not be too hard on them or him. So he writes a letter home, okay? He writes a letter home explaining that he's going to be on this train, which is passing their little farm at the outskirts of town. If they could forgive him, they were to hang a white ribbon in the tree at the bend of the tracks when the train goes by the farm, the family farm. If, they, if the ribbon was not hanging there, he told them in this letter, when he came by, then he would never bother them again. I'll ride right out of your life, and I'll never, I'll never come back, if that's what you wish. With every clickety-clack of that train, you can understand the boy's getting nervous. He get more nervous and more nervous until finally, until finally he says, listen, let's trade places, trade places, please. You sit in the window. You tell me what you see on the tree. So the boy takes the inside seat and the stranger that he's met on the train takes the window seat. Let me go back to reading here. And as the train approached the familiar landmarks of his boyhood, the suspense became more than he could bear, and he changed seats with his companion who watched from the window for him. In a minute, the tree was in sight, and eyes bright with sudden tears. His companion reached over and put his hand on the boy's knee and whispered hoarsely, It's all right, son. The whole tree is white with ribbons. Oh, I love that story. Every time I read that, my heart just leaps. Because 2,000 years ago, there was, a, there was a tree erected on a, on a mountain called Calvary. And that tree still stands tonight in the heart of those who turn their minds to the cross. That tree still stands tonight. And do you know what I see tonight? That tree is covered with white ribbons. Can I get an amen from this audience? That tree is covered with white ribbons. The white ribbons declare, you can come home. You have been forgiven. I forgave you 2,000 years ago. You've been running from the wrong one. I'm not somebody to run from. I'm somebody to run to. I'm not somebody to be afraid of. I'm somebody to be a friend of. I'm your friend. I'm the maker of all things who loves and wants you. You can come home. Get off of that train, girl. Get off of that train, boy. I've been waiting for this day for years. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Ah, oh, but Jesus, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many life sentences you have. You are forgiven. Read my lips. You are forgiven. Wow. What a God. The maker of all things who loves and wants me. Man, I want to love and want him back, don't you? And oh boy, if there's somebody... That needs forgiveness from me. I want to find that person. And I want to tell her, I want to tell him, I forgive you. In fact, I'm going to invite you to stand. Why don't we stand? We've been sitting a lot this evening. We've got to get home together. You come tomorrow night, we'll get that other dramatic, profound story of forgiveness. One of the greatest in all of literature. And we'll say, there must be something in that for us and today. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for these few moments here together. Thank you for the prayer that was prayed from that middle cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, that prayer takes us all in. Heavenly Father, we have not known what we were doing. Oh, there were times we knew exactly what we were doing. But those men who were nailing the nails, they knew exactly what they were doing. But that prayer is so generous that Jesus excuses our ignorance. Because if we knew we were doing it to Jesus, we never would do it. So thank you for the forgiveness. Thank you for the gift of a friendship with the maker of all things who loves and wants me. Let us go home tonight with joy in our hearts. Peace. And if there's somebody else that needs the words, I forgive you. Work it out, dear God. Work it out.
Thank you for loving us. We, we really do. We love you back. In Jesus' name, amen.